Okay. You are the master. Right. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Ahmad Reza Sadehi, uh, who is from uh, a professor of okay. science. Here is a thing. Okay. Use that. Yeah, you don't need to read so much. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so he's a full professor of computer science in the Technische Universität Darmstadt in Germany. So he heads the system security lab. He's also the director of Internet Collaborative Research Institute for Secure and Resilient and Autonomous Systems in the Darmstadt. Uh, has been awarded with several awards, most notably the renowned German prize Karl Heinz Becker for his research on trusted and trustworthy computer technology and its transfer to industrial practice. He also recently received the ECM Zigzag Outstanding Contribution Award for Research, Education, and Management Leadership Institute, and also for pioneering contributions in content protection, uh, mobile security, and hardware security. So he's one of the of uh, CCS from Chinese. So, without further ado, let me uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Ahmad. Okay. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you very, very much for, for, for the very efficient uh, introduction. Uh, and also for having me here. Um, I actually like uh, Miami, so this is why I have already collaboration with some of you, especially with Sergio. Um, and this talk is, is kind of a collection of uh, kind of my experience in the area of IoT, especially with industry. So this is why it is more or less, there are lots of theoretical aspects behind it, but we are going to talk about the practical aspects mostly. And if you have questions about details, no problem, I have enough material to show you, and there are lots of papers on that. So maybe just very short saying where I'm coming from. Uh, so Darmstadt in Germany. Germany is in Europe. <laughs> and uh, I mean, a lot of people don't know where it is. And we are very near to Frankfurt. Um, we have a relatively large uh, cybersecurity center because German government recognized in 2006 that's actually 1998, but 2006, they started to spend huge amount of money for cybersecurity. And currently there are a number of uh, three actually big uh, centers in, in uh, Germany for cybersecurity. And one of them is in Darmstadt, actually the biggest one. And there are 300 people working in security and privacy. Uh, different disciplines, I meanwhile, I don't know who is working them. Uh, there are so many people. Anyway, so this is a place where you can talk about all kinds of security, from social sciences to hardcore uh, security, which is operating system security. Okay, uh, you all know the buzz of uh, IoT. Uh, for the last, let's say, six, seven years, we're talking about this buzz, and uh, this would be the picture. Uh, that means the, uh, the configuration of uh, IoT, everything is connected to everything, and people like it uh, because we are. I remember that as I worked in industry for telecommunication industry, we were making jokes about, you know, mobile phones because I'm not very old, but mobile phones at that time, even you know, 10, 15 years ago, they were such a device, and um, we were joking about who is going to send 140 characters as a as a message. I mean. You must be insane to do that. You can also call someone. Uh, but uh, SMS became a big business, and then now Twitter, um, which is not maybe good, but this is the picture that we are going to have. And I just uh, wrote there, can we avoid it? I mean, we cannot avoid that because I see that many things are connected to each other. I am using at home so many connected devices. So, uh, and the next generation will do it as it is common sense. So how do we prepare for that? If you are you like statistics, I don't like statistics because I think that most of them are fake news. But uh, if you like statistics, there are a number of consulting companies. Each year they come up with new prognosis about IoT. How many billions of devices are going to be used? And this is from Gardner Institute, actually a well-known institute for prognosis, which most of them are wrong. But doesn't matter. By 2020, they estimate that internet-connected things will outnumber the human beings, the number of human beings. 
They estimate that also 65% of enterprises are going to use IoT technology. So in my lab, in the last, let's say, four or five years, actually five and a half years, we are looking to IoT uh, devices all over in the world. We buy them, we have lots of money for that. And we analyze them regarding their security, their functionality, and also uh, privacy aspects. And I must say that uh, in the last five years, I have been observing that from, let's say, 10 IoT manufacturers, now we have something around 3,000 all over the world, especially lots of them are in, in Asia, and uh, particularly in China, but also a number of startups in Silicon Valley and in Europe, uh, also in Germany, are doing in uh, different areas IoT. So Garden Institute uh, just prognosed that, okay, 25% of all identified attacks in the future will be based on IoT device. And we are going to talk about those attacks. So this is the motivating part. I'm going to try to entertain you at the beginning. You're not going to sleep. And then when the technical part comes, you may sleep. So what is actually IoT challenge for those of you who are doing actually research in, in this area? What would be the IoT challenge? What is the actually, maybe I just asked the question. There are so many students here, some of them I met yesterday. What is actually the, the new aspect of when, it, when we talk about IoT, for example, security, compared to what we know from computer security and uh, server security in the last 30 years? What is the new? There are, th there are some things written there, but what is actually the, the real new aspect of it? Anybody? Any idea? Diversity, yes, diversity or heterogeneity. But diversity we had before. Those of you who have heard about ad hoc networks, <laughs> sensor networks, sensor networks were dying. No papers were accepted at sensor networks conference. And no IoT kind of re internet. Uh, so, what would be another aspect? I just wrote the size, but I'll stay. I think the, the, the magic word is the combination of things. And you can see why the combination, which direction, why is that important. But it's not completely clear to many of us what is actually the new challenge when it comes to uh, security of IoT. So what we are doing in uh, Darmstadt, at least in my group, I'm just giving you a very short overview. We work on security architectures on these devices. So how can I isolate an application on a very small device, an IoT device, we'll come to that. And this is a, a work that we have been doing with Intel for some years. Then we are looking into voice assistants, how to hack them, how to misuse them, uh, and how to uh, make a constructive system for defensive devices. We also look into the fitness or health trackers. What are the security aspects, privacy aspects? We also look into uh, the context-based uh, pairing. So this is one of the challenges that differs from ad hoc networks. Why? If you have 3,000 devices, how do you do a key exchange between them that you have a secure channel between these devices? Are you using to public key put them? on a small sensor, how do you do that? So currently, we just pair the devices when they are in proximity of each other, or you use Bluetooth. And they say, okay, password one, two, three, four, and then you just say, okay, one, two, three, four, I accept it, and that's it. Now, how do you connect many, many devices? Let's say I have a home about 30 devices. How do you connect them in a secure way? You can go through a gateway, yes, but how do they come in? So this is something that we were working on for some, some time, and that is based on context. When the devices are in the same context, they generate entropy from the context, for example, light, sound, and everything else. And those devices who are in the same context, they generate the same key than those devices that are in your neighbor house. But there are lots of security questions that have to be solved. So this is one of the challenges that differs from PC work that we do. Another aspect is, this is a work that we are doing with Sergio Group, is that when you have even a encrypted communication between all these devices, how can you infer 
and adversely, which is outside your house, how can they infer what the user is doing at all? So they activate. It. This is a project with uh, North Carolina University where we have a firewall for IoT. So if your toaster suddenly you want to talk to your IP camera, then somebody must raise an alarm why a toaster wants to talk to IP camera. And then there is a, another project which is called Home Switch. This is uh, indeed an awareness about the privacy. And you get all this information on your mobile phone, like the privacy setting that you have on Apple and Google-based uh, phones. So that's for user awareness. What I'm going to focus on in this talk is the IoT botnets, distributed denial of service attack. If you have a, so the idea is to make a seismograph, like a seismograph for earthquake or for tornado. You want also to know if there is a big, a large scale attack coming that is exploiting many, many, many IoT devices. How do you prevent this or how do you detect that? And then you, you just go to apply a security policy, like isolate those devices, destroy those devices, send somebody to repair them, or many other ways of doing it. So let me first entertain you, because in the last three, four years, I have been uh, witnessing so many crazy devices in this, this area. And as you see, I am a big fan of Minions, because Minions are the best PhD students. They always follow their supervisor. They do what he or she says. So indeed, IoT can be characterized by that you forget about many things because people want to get their devices to the market, sell it, and people buy that. And let's go through some of the devices that people buy. So as I told you, we buy lots of devices whenever there is a device on the market, and we look into their functionality, security, and privacy aspect. So this is a kind of plug for the uh, power uh, plug. And then this is a, a, let's say, access point. Now, interestingly, there are a number of companies, and one of them, I don't name the company, it's a company in China. This is the same access point, but has the same Mac address. Two devices, same hardware, same Mac address, the network is crashed. So it was. It, it took a long time to understand why the network is crashing in our lab, because these two had the same matter. So then you ask yourself, what are these guys doing? And then when you look into the the apps and the web page, this is what you get: this gibberish. So there is there is no really guidance. What is about this uh, device? What? How 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 could it be that these devices have the same matter? So there is a big functionality problem. Another thing is this is a tab which has a Linux on it, so it's a combination of Linux. You can um, remotely control this water tab, and maybe you cannot see, but this tab is target of a ransomware attack. So <laughs> you don't get water if if you don't pay. Yeah. So this is actually kind of crazy, and um, there are other things that will definitely come. This is not Hollywood anymore, but for example, you, you can have on your, let's say, in, in bathroom, the toilet will tell you how is your health. Yeah, this is for another purpose, but the toilet will tell you that. This is uh, uh, another uh, application of IoT. This, this spoon uh, tells you on your smartphone how fast you're eating. It's not very good for students who are just working at home and eating besides programming. Not very helpful. This is a neighborly application that opens the door when you are near to the home of your friends. So you just configure the system and you are near to Sergio's home. The door goes open and I just appear in Sergio's apartment. I don't know who is doing that, but there are maybe people who like that because this is a product. This is a product that I was really puzzling what is good for. It sends you uh, condolences to your beloved ones when your heart stops to, stops to beat. So I was thinking, who is going to use that? 
And please, uh, <laughs> please apologize my cynicism. I'm a bit sarcastic. Um, you need this when you go to Saudi Arabian uh, embassy to ask for a visa. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, just <laughs> this is my favorite one. It's called uh, Stress Buster. I have it because in Germany, aggressive driving is it's fashion. Um, and this um, device measures the, the the tension of skin. And the tension, skin tension is, is directly proportional to depression. There are lots of studies about that. So, and if you are very much stressed, it generates an alarm. The problem is this alarm makes me even more stressed. So I get much more aggressive when the alarm comes up. So if that were the repaired, it's good for at least somebody for like me who drives fast. So just uh, say, okay, your stress level is very high. Stop doing it. There are also other things. This is my favorite one. This is an uh, Arduino uh, circuit. It's a platform, it's an embedded platform that you put in your socket. It gives you a small electric, electric, electric shock when you are watching a Netflix episode and you go to sleep. It gives you a shock and then you continue <laughs> watching. It's a very light shock. So, this one is uh, used for Christmas tree. Now Christmas is coming. If you change your partner, you just change a digital picture. That's very practical. So, <laughs> so this um, people buy these things. They use it, and as long as people buy these things and they use it, we love it because we are we are remaining in business. We are doing IT security. That's our business. So. This is a coffee machine that I have uh, a picture of. When you want to get a coffee in a, a hallway of a company, it asks you to set up an exchange account, Windows exchange account, and then it gives you free coffee. They want data from you. This one is a uh, kind of public toilet in the streets of San Francisco. You can use the to uh, toilet if you download an app and use the app to open the door. Yeah. This one from Lille, a German, uh, very kind of known German company. The washing machine is used for, uh, it's paid per use. You do it remotely, and uh, you also have to give a lot of data about yourself. But the real problem is that you're not still in the security part, they're in the entertainment part. But the real problems of all these IoT things is that at home, for example, I have a lighting system. But if I want to update the system, it just says update, and the whole light is out. So then there is a switch off. So I am sitting in darkness, and my smartphone is saying, you're getting updated. So these are really real world problems that we are concerned with. And then we are going to, towards the security. There is another one, and this is a, I mean, most of you know Nest thermostat, and this thermostat is uh, just telling you <laughs> restarting back in a bit again because it's updating. Now it's cold at home, and you don't know what does it mean back in a bit. It could be one hour, it could be three hours. So your heating system doesn't work. These are our experience with devices. I just put some of them together. Now, what are the typical IoT devices that people are using? I just uh, categorize them in three categories. The first one, I mean, the first one is actually IoT devices like this smartphone. People consider that as IoT devices. We are going to talk about mid-level devices. I wrote some of the, for example, a sensor from Philips or IP camera. And I wrote some of the technical data that you see how much memory you have. What can you do with these devices? Can you do strong cryptography with it? Yeah? So, and there are low level devices like this one. And you see it's very low amount of memory. Uh, for certain computations, you cannot do that with this device. This is another level, this is a, a kind of a door sensor that I have at home as well. And you cannot do much with these things. So, 
what is the assumption of these devices? What can we assume about these devices? This is what we started with Cisco to think about, can we make any security assumptions about the devices? So we decided to make no security assumptions about the devices. So the, there is no security architectures on these devices. There is no memory isolation, no MPU, no other, uh, or no uh, memory management unit, which is a small MPU. So this is our assumptions that uh, we're going to do. Now about the security and privacy, you may ask, do they use any security in these uh, devices? Yes, they do. For communication, definitely. For example, you use Wi-Fi. They use the security aspects in Wi-Fi. And mostly the, the credentials are kind of default credentials, like default passwords. You have a ZigBee protocol. You don't need to know what ZigBee is. If you know it, it's good. If you don't know, it doesn't matter. It's just a protocol. They have pre-installed key on devices. And these devices have master key. From that master key, they get a device key. And, and then they communicate with uh, AES. Then you have Bluetooth. All of you know, you do pairing with Bluetooth. And then you have Z-Wave, which is uh, kind of like ZP, but they use, for example, QR, let's say codes to uh, use a smartphone to copy the public key, use the public key to encrypt a, uh, uh, another key to, to, to pair two devices. The smartphone is in between. So these are the communication problems. Now, you say, okay, at least the communication part is already clear for me. However, there is a warning here that many of these devices do not have the proper security engineering. Why does it mean? So, for example, this is the Philips. I don't know if anybody uses Philips U bulbs at home. Nobody? You? Okay. At least one, one victim is here. I use them as well. So, these uh, um, lamps, uh, uh, they use firmware, and they are getting updated every now and then. Now, the problem is that it's, they use an encryption key to update the firmware. So you send the firmware, firmware is encrypted, on the device it is decrypted, and then it's updated. So the problem is that you can extract this key by the so-called side channel attacks or power analysis, this is what people from Weizmann Institute in Israel do. And the design mistake is that it is the same key. For all bulbs, the same key. Worldwide. Yeah? So, you take this global key. What they did, they did it in a dramatic way. You can do it much easier, but they wanted to sell this key as a paper, which was by IEEE Security and Privacy last year. They sent a drone. This drone updates the devices with a malicious code. That malicious code connects to other devices up to 100 meters. If there is another house with all these U lamps, they connect and they connect further and they infect all the devices with the same update key. So, this is a fundamental, or let's say, a fatal uh, uh, security engineering problem that uh, people from Philips didn't see. And Philips is not an unknown company. So, you see that. It's good to have at least the basic lectures in a, at university and you do a good job. So, not, not this job. So, <clears throat> here, on the discussion with Bogdan, this is what uh, we did, for example, for, for uh, Fitness Tracker. This is uh, Fitbit, for uh, company Fitbit. As you see, uh, my guys could change the number of steps that you do on the server to 80 million steps. This is a real, real time. So you are manipulating the data on the server of the insurance company. Then we have um, what I call unsmart lock. That is uh, uh, IoT lock. You can uh, reverse engineer the key generation uh, procedure, and you can open it. I'm just giving you some example. This is a, a spine vacuum cleaner. There is a vacuum cleaner with a camera. And uh, what they did is that they put uh, 
it has a default password. They can they could use this default password to send to hack the device to send uh, this device commands that can remotely be controlled and remotely take pictures. So before I came, uh, one of my guys hacked into this this uh, vacuum cleaner, which is the most sold vacuum cleaner in in Europe. And what is interesting about this vacuum cleaner is that they used uh, Amazon IoT service server for, for you know, sending commands. And the authentication is done with a MAC address in plain text. So if you do a exhaustive search over MAC addresses, you can get all MAC addresses of these devices. You don't know where this device is, but you can automatically, you can remotely control the device. So it's a kind of... Uh, but bot attack, so everybody at home who has this thing, you can run it and they say, what's happening here? And they also keep state, that means they, they measure everything, so you can get a plan of the room that they are cleaning, that they uh, store it on Amazon server, you can retrieve that from them. So this is a, from a real house, we just uh, anonymized that a bit, because uh, this is forbidden in Germany too. So, this is, so anyway. This is an aquarium. It's uh, in a, in a, I think it is in, in Las Vegas in a casino. It has a thermostat. They could hack to this one, and this one was connected to the intranet of the casino, so they could get into the database of the casino and see who lost with how much money. And this is a pacemaker that all of you know. If you can remotely update the pacemaker, you can kill someone if you want. And the state secretary Cheney. If you remember, some years ago, he was afraid of this because he had a remotely updatable placement. So, then there are attacks on, on voice assistants. Maybe you know it or not. There is some of these attacks, they consider they analyze the, the voice and analyze the language, and they find a way to send a command to um, Alexa and Co. that human being does not understand, but Alexa and Co. understand. Or dolphin attack uh, from CCS 2017, where you send in a, a command to, a, to, a, to Alexa at home that is in a range of more than uh, 20 kilohertz, where human being does not hear, but the member of, of, uh, of the speaker or of the microphone understands the command. And we are doing, uh, um, we are doing attacks on the ecosystem of, of uh, of uh, Alexa and Siri, and this ecosystem is based on the so-called skills. I mean, these are kind of apps that uh, have different kind of combination of words that Alexa understands, but uh, human beings, for example, I want to uh, watch Netflix. And for that, you have a special app, and that app is connected to Amazon server and to, uh, and lastly to, to Alexa, and you can Make it in such a way that Alexa lies to you. If you say, close the garage door, Alexa says, okay, but the garage door is not closed. So this is what is done in this attack. What is upcoming, I think, is, is attacks over social networks. Because these devices are connected <laughs> very soon to social networks. And then you can see new attacks that come with uh, ransomware over social networks. So I call them anti-social networks. But I'm going now towards the real technical part. Um, and this is about the Mirai. And I don't know who has heard about Mirai attack. So this is a distributed denial of service attack. It connects 100,000, so here it was 145,000, but uh, it's, uh, currently the other uh, versions of Mirai are even uh, connecting more devices all over the world, and it, it attacks the backbone networks of service providers. So for example, I am, I, for example, Netflix server is completely down, and I'm, I'm sure millions of people, they don't know what to do if Netflix is down, because they permanently watch Netflix, okay? So how this attack works, for those of you who don't know it, in a way, it's, it's very actually simple. There is a command and control server 
they know that these devices have default passwords that are not changed. So they try all kind of passwords, and then if one of them is, is uh, okay, then the device, you know, they don't have access and the device is infected. What Mirai does is also closes all the ports that no other instance of Mirai or even any other malware can infect this device. So it's a really intelligent uh, malware. So what is done afterwards is that this device scans the network for other devices and does the same. But always there is a communication with the command and control server. That, that server sends the malicious code. And in that case, you get a snowball effect with all the devices that are uh, after each other um, um, compromised. So now there are variants of this attack. One of them is Hajime. It's called Hajime. is a distributed Mirai. Mirai has a one server. Now this one has many servers. It makes it even more complicated. Uh, and it has it exists for all kinds of platforms. Then there is Pezrai, which is only focused on an uh, IP camera. And then there is Brickabot, which destroys the device. So it deletes files. It's not really interesting. Why bots are interesting? Because there is a uh, report uh, in the current administration, US administration, that asks for validation against bots. So if you have a product, you should kind of uh, have some kind of proof that this product cannot be misused or exploited for a bot attack, which is very hard to, to do, given the, the bad security of IoT devices. So, but the question that we had with uh, Cisco is, what is actually, how can we identify a compromised device in a large network as soon as we cut to the home, uh, smart home networks? How can we identify that, uh, that the device is compromised in an efficient and effective way? And under which assumptions? Assumptions was that we don't have any security updates. We don't have fancy uh, crypto coprocessor fancy operating systems, fancy virtualization. We don't have even virtual memory. How do we do that? So usually, we have all these devices connected to a gateway. And there are, if there are some devices uh, uh, malicious, then we have different security measures that we know in the last, let's say, 30, 30 35 years. The typical anomaly-based intrusion detection systems what is the problem of these uh, intrusion detection systems is that they consider network traffic, which is very dense. IoT network traffic is not dense. It's rare. It's very scarce. So how, if, you, if you apply that to, them, to IoT, you have a very high false alarms. Even the intrusion detection systems that we know have high, high false alarms. Then there is a signature bit. Uh, Signature base means that they have they must know the attacks, they must know the signature. If you don't know the signature, how do you do the unknown attacks? And what we try to do is to think about is it possible to lower this high falls alarm and make human intervention as small as possible. And this is where the another buzzword comes in, and that's machine learning. Yeah, so because everybody is doing machine learning, so we thought maybe we use machine learning here as well. And I'll tell you why it's more effective. This is the paper. It's called Guard IoT. It's on archive. It's based on a publication of ICDSC. Yes, and uh, if you're interested, you can look at it. Talk to me. So, what are the assumptions and adversary model here? We, we need to have an adversary model. Here are gateways. These are devices at home, and some of them are uh, compromised. We want to identify them. So IoT device in the local network is infected. We want to identify it. Our assumption is there that the manufacturer is not malicious. So if the manufacturer is malicious, the whole story is over. Yeah? The second assumption is that when you install a device to your local network, at the time of installation, the device is not hacked. But after the installation. Yeah? 
reasonable assumptions and then detect the malicious device. So initial thing would be, how do we do that? We have so many devices, we want to detect which devices are compromised. So for that, we need some design decisions. What do we do? We, we don't do any assumption about security and devices. So if we don't do any assumptions, the devices do not have the computational power to do fancy things. So one decision is that we, we, we must see there are different IoT devices with different vulnerabilities. So there will be a huge landscape of attacks. What we need is an autonomous adaptive uh, scheme that can adapt to what happens. And it should be based on device type rather than one model for 100,000 of devices. So device types, like the equivalence class. Yeah? Another thing is there is a resource limitation. If there are resource limitations on these devices, what is the design decision? We need a gateway. So we put the computation into the gateway. But then each gateway does its own computation. And then when we have many gateways for many smart homes, there must be another service, for example, provided by Google currently or by Amazon, that also analyzes the data on the gateways. I come to that one. So another design decision is heterogeneity, diversity you mentioned. And we want to have um, no uh, falls around. That is, again, the aspect of device type specific identification of device. So if I put all the device, devices that are similar into one equivalence class, and I can learn their behavior, then I can, at the, at the, at the, how do you say, you just, you just keep two birds with one uh, whatever, yeah? So, I don't know, I just mix these, these quotes every time. Uh, you, I don't know. It's a military language, okay. You just uh, have, let's say, two targets. <laughs> <laughs> with one bullet, and this is what we are uh, aiming for. The other thing, uh, decision is in the scarcity of communications. IoT devices, we don't send massive traffic on, off. I do this, I do that, I also do this, I also do that. So for that, we need a system. Communication is low. We don't have enough data. How do we collect these data from different gateways? This is called the federated learning. That means you, you learn at each gateway and put all of them together. So I think um, I must accelerate a bit. And how is the system design? Given these design decisions, this is our gateway, these are our devices. So these are our devices. Yeah. We do. Here are gateway, we do computation here. And then there is this IoT security service provider. This is our Google or Amazon. Here we want to identify devices. The computation is done there. So it's called device fingerprinting. Then we do the, we send the fingerprints to the service provider, but don't forget that we have many security. Each of them sends these speaker pins to the security service provider, and the device, because of this massive number of fingerprints, we can make a device type identification. So we put those vectors that are similar to each other into one class, we cluster it. And then here we have detection profile training, that means we profile the devices when they communicate to the gateway, what are the communications? We come to that in more detail. And then we put a global profile in the provider. So this is a local profile, this is a global profile because each security gateway has its own local profile. They update the global one, and then the global one is then put into the back into the local ones because you are now having a better model better weights, yeah. or accurate, more accurate. And if there is, there are some, some of them compromised, 
find what is the device type and the anomaly detection should give you the current the correct device type with a high accuracy this is the goal and the vision so now we go to details how do i fingerprint the device so as i said you want to have device type and not a one model for all devices okay so what we observe is that when you look at the protocols or communication of these devices to gateway you will see a periodic behavior this is long-term ex experiments what does it mean periodic behavior so that means identification is based on characteristic periodic communication patterns how do we get that this is just an example for the ip camera for each device we have this profile i mean this fingerprint so these are different protocols that this device is using in communication with gateway for example address reservation protocol tcp protocol all these kind of protocols and when you see that these we do some magic and from this magic you get that for example address reservation pro protocol has a period a periodic period here in in case of dns it has also a period but you see three here you cannot see it very well but it's three peaks that are very very near to each other how do we get this pattern so what we do we want to say that each device is a fingerprint that is robust okay how do we do that this is a package here then you may ask some students are not sleeping they ask but what is if the communication is encrypted what is the communication is encrypted? how do i do any analysis do i need the payload yeah look at that yeah but you're not sleeping you should not ask. <laughs> this is cheating. So as soon as we answer, uh, so these are the packet flow, okay? And how you do it? That's a different story. But then you discretize this packet flow. For example, in a certain uh, time slot, like one second, is a packet arriving or more packets arriving or not? Zero or one? If you make a time series, then this is a standard way. You do discrete Fourier analysis, then you get a a kind of spectrum and then you take the local maximum as first step at these frequencies and then what you do you do an autocorrelation of signals because autocorrelation shows how how similar a signal to its is to self this is all standard uh, signal processing and then you need to do some stability or noise filtering to really get the real period, because you may get the wrong period. We don't want that. We want a robust period. So there is a nice filtering way of doing that. I can tell you later how it is. And then after you have a period and a stability metric, stability metric means that this period is really a period. It's, it's, it comes again and again. Then we do a, so we have now our period or candidate for period. When we have this period, we make statistics around this period. So it's a center of our sphere of all kind of information that we need as features to understand the device. To see this is the behavior of the, this is the fingerprint, sorry, fingerprint of this device. For that, this is our center, and then we do feature extraction. Now, how do we do that? This is not an automatic procedure, this is a human logic there is no algorithm that can tell you these set of features are complete but you can take a statistics that you think as a logic thinking human is are these features enough and then you do long-term experiments one year what we did one and a half years with different data sets data sets in lab data sets in real homes and data set on Cisco devices. And then you see, are you right or wrong? Experimental results, machine learning, 
In practice, is experimental. In theory, everything is beautiful. In practice, it crumbles. Yeah? Okay. So now we use we use a very simple classification of the K ring. This is K Fourier's neighbor that is really the, the kindergarten machine learning. Everybody is using that. We are engineers. We use that as well. Okay. So and then these features. Now you say why three three features? There is a logic behind it, but we have time to go through all of them. Then you have a device type prediction. So these features gives me a device type number one. For example, toaster. Oh, I don't know. Maybe you don't like toaster, but okay, a toaster with Wi-Fi connection uh, from company X from 2008 and 2009 and 2010. They all will be categorized in the same thing because they use always the same hardware. The software is changing, but the distance between these vectors of features is not big because the software is not changing much. They have some, some new features, but they are still clustered in one class. So these are the things that you can see during through the experiments. So how do we extract these features? So there is a logic behind it. We want to know so these features. So surrounding uh, around this, this uh, period, we have a candidate period. Then we say, okay, how many, what are the number of periodic flows? Because you have different protocols that this device is using. So what are the number? Then we do, is the number of the number of periodic flows at which protocol level is that? Is that physical layer? Is that uh, uh, network layer? Is that link layer? All these things help you to understand the fingerprint of the device. Okay. Another thing is how stable is this period? Am I seeing it, observing it more and more? And for that, you need to calculate something. The first thing that we calculate is, is this candidate period fits into the signal time interval that you sampled? If it completely fits, and you see it over and over again, and of course this is a real period. Sometimes due to noise, they just jump over the interval. And then you need to use other stability metrics that I didn't put on the slide. But one of the stability metrics is this R, which just says how many of these periods, candidate periods, are fitting into the length of the signal that you measured. Okay? If it is completely fitting, that means if this if this thing is one, then it's perfect. But it's not always perfect, so you have to have other measures that I don't show it here. So, and then you do kind of mean and standard division of these, these uh, stability metrics. Another thing is how accurate is this period? So you see, all these things are information around the periodicity. And there is a way how to measure that. And how uh, is the periodic duration? How long is that due to the uh, due to the measurements? So after you have all these uh, features, these are 33 features, and that was after one and a half years for us. We saw always the same thing with around now it is around 60 devices. Before that, at the beginning we started with 30 devices. Now we are increasing the number of devices. So. So the evaluation, I just go through it. I just said that is the first one. This is not very, uh, the recent one, the numbers I don't have, but the recent one is uh, 60 devices. So just to come to the result, these are curves, but these curves just only tell you that when the samples, the number of samples are growing, the accuracy of the algorithm is very good in identifying or classifying a, 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 a device into a device type. So the precision is very high. And you must be careful that when we say machine learning algorithms, depending on what you do, the precision of 98 is not good. That doesn't mean that it's very good. In this case, it's good because it's not a safety thing. You cannot say my car is for 98% secure. 2% you may die. And most of the cases is that you, you fall in that 2%. So you don't want to hear this 2%, but it's all kind of uh, probability. So, so this is 
um, just show you uh, the so-called precision that the device types of the samples that we, get, we, we give to the algorithm, the device types are correcting with high accuracy are identical. So the signature is robust. Okay, now we identify a device. How do we do anomaly detection? How do I know that the device is compromised? First, I have to categorize it into type and then see if this device type is, is uh, compromised. So how do I do that? The goal and the hypothesis here is that, and this is a very subtle thing, we must make an assumption. The first assumption is we want to know what is the benign behavior of a device, not whether or not this device is behaving maliciously, but first I want to know, I want to understand what is the benign behavior. And if something is deviating, then it may be an attack, especially the denial of distributed denial of sales. Okay? So that means we want to understand, even if there's an unknown traffic pattern, we want to, uh, to understand if it's a malicious one or not. Okay, so, so we assume that malicious behavior deviates from the normal behavior. This is our assumption. I think this is a reasonable assumption. Now, for that, we use another machine learning algorithm, which is now subject of research. I don't know if anyone of you is working with that. It's called Gated Recurrent Unit. It's a machine learning algorithm that is used in linguistic aspects for languages. So for example, it's also actually relatively new. It does text prediction and correction. For example, if you type computer search, then you get a completion of your work. Yeah? And what we do now, high level, is the following. We take the communication packets between the device and the gateway we translate this, we transfer, so we map these packets to symbols of a language. We feed these symbols of a language into the machine learning algorithm, GRU, which is very accurate and nice, fancy, deep learning, all these fuzzy words are inside. And since it's a good one, we get the accuracy, probability, of certain symbols which then remaps to a certain packet. Yeah? So we want to know with what probability a certain packet, a certain behavior occurs. And this is done with this. So translating a packet communication, network communication to symbols is not new, but putting it in this context is new. Okay, so now let's say here I just put it uh, a bit uh, orange. GRU models, models can also learn normal network packet sequence patterns. And let me give you a flavor of it. So this is again your packets from a device type. Now we know a device type because we know how to fingerprint. Now we have packet sequences from this device type. We do the characterize this packet is one of the characterization is a vector here we took seven characteristic aspects what are the characteristic aspects of a device communicating to a gateway the direction of communication which ports is incoming is outgoing all the information that the packet length tcp flags all these things that are or inter arrival time these are the things that identify so to say this normal behavior we fix those parameters that we need as characteristic for this communication. And then we do a symbol mapping. We take a random list of symbols, so symbols, for example, 99 symbols, and then we map those characteristic vectors to these those symbols. And then this GRU model gives you the probability that the next symbol occurs. Given N symbols before. So if you if you see if you observe twenty symbols, what is the probability that the next symbol is like this? Yeah. And after that, 
Do you have, of course, for these all these machines, I mean, you need to have parameters that you adjust by experiments, long-term experiments that you say, okay, if my pro uh, probabilities of accuracy and my thresholds are like this, then I get a high accuracy that the, the behavior of the device or the packet that comes next is estimated with high accuracy. So, and then one example is here, is for dealing IP camera, so we took Mirai code, which is open, and we, we started to play with it. In Germany, you are not allowed to use malicious code and give it to uh, students in the lab, because some of them, they get nuts and put it on a network or attack a network of a company, and then the university is in deep trouble. This is why it took a long time to get permission, even for research, because students, you cannot trust them usually. Yeah. Well, it, they go to a party and then, so let's hack this device. Yeah? And when they are good and they are drunk, they do better hacking. So, and, so this is not something that it is, I hope it is not recorded, you know what I'm saying. Uh, so this is a kind of characteristic of, of, our, of, the, of IP uh, uh, camera. And the symbol mapping, this is a random symbols. And at the end, you get uh, the GRU gives this to you, this problem, these are real numbers. And then some of the symbols have very low probability for this behavior profile. So that means there is something that is fishy. Is it an attack or not? Still, we don't know. We have to look further. And further looking shows that this is indeed an attack. Yeah. This is just an example, and when you evaluate it, you see, okay, these probabilities are very low. This doesn't make sense for this device, and then you raise an alarm. You just need to have very high accuracy, otherwise it's false. And I can tell you that after one and a half years, they could, my guys could convince me that they are not cheating. Because when your students say, oh, it works, look, we have this table, they don't believe them. Yeah, you just say, do it again, do it again. And at this kind of interrogation, these two students, and one, at one instance, they either reveal the truth <laughs> or not. But we did that with two groups, and they got very similar results. So not that I don't trust my students, but, you know, trust but verify. Okay? So, in, in, this is Ronald Reagan. Um, okay, so this is the experimental thing with Mirai. This is our attack server. In the attack server, Mirai has... Uh, command and control, loader, that means infecting the device, listening, listening to network, what happens, is it coming something back or not, and Mirai sometimes put the devices into standby. The devices do, don't do anything, they just listen. And that is where we get false false alarms, because we are not used with the behavior of, of devices, not that they have long time of standby. Because user is interacting, they go, the, the, the user is like going from one room to another, and so on. So these are the small things, but standby is good for us because we see that it's a long time standby, doesn't matter, no attack is happening. But standby means listen, but there is no attack. Yeah. Okay, so I, I just go through it, this is not important. I just tell you the, show you a cool uh, picture that my students did for me, and he, he suffered to make it in such a way that I like it, so I show you, I promise him to show it. So this is the GRU, is on the IoT security server, this is the Amazon server, for example. You have a global model there, and these are security gateways, and each of them has a local data set. Yeah? Now, global model is pushed into the first a random global model is pushed into all the security gateways random, and then this security gateway start to collect data. You see, it's it goes from blinky blinky, okay, and then afterwards each of them sends the the weights of the neural network to the IoT security service. Now there will be a global average model for example. <laughs> and then this global average model is then sent to all these security gateways. Now they have new updated global model and they start again 
to make their own local trees, and that goes further and further. And the question is here, in the federated learning, these new weights, how, how many times do you re repeat that until you get a very good accuracy? So do you see any problem here? There are two questions here that nobody asked. Sergio, don't sleep. What, what was it? There are two problems. Exactly. So what happens? Any idea? If one of these security gateways is compromised, or some of them are compromised, what is actually the threshold of the, comp uh, of the security gateways that they can be compromised? 50%, 30%? What, how do I uh, know that? Do I need to use Byzantine protocols for that? Do I need to use blockchain to have another buzzword? Yeah. Uh, what should I do? So you can see these different gateways of, in the same uh, environment, uh, in the same home? No, 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 no. A, a, a gateway is for one home. Okay. You have 10 gateways for 10 homes. Okay. And Google is the IoT security service. So Google says, I manage all these things. There are a number of security problems. One was mentioned. What is when one or more are going to be compromised? I will be finished very soon. Don't worry. I'm just trying to do the interaction. Maybe you give me some ideas that you don't have. Yeah? So um, I will come to that. Let me go through this. This is just the uh, to show you that the anomaly detection of Mirai for, is, is an example, how to detect the Mirai. You see all these uh, numbers here. These are the different stages of Mirai attack, pre-infection, infection, scanning. So scanning the network, infecting, pre-infecting. And as you see, you have very high accuracy. The only bad accuracy is when the devices are standby because they give false alarm. But when the device is standby, there is no attack running. This is not harmless. Uh, but my question is still, this is, for example, showing that Mirai is using for denial of service attack when the devices are infected. They are using all these different attacks. So we have UD plane. These are different names of uh, um, flooding attacks. That you flood the networks with, with uh, packets. If you see here, this attack with UDP play has a low uh, accuracy. This one has a low accuracy as well. The name, this is a virtual machine for gamers. The attack on gaming software is also used within Mirai to, to flood the server, but this is too much detail. So this one is the problem because these uh, flooding attacks, they use also the uh, UDP themselves. So when a device is using UDP, and the attack is also using UDP, you get bad results. Because you don't know if it's a benign or not. So these are the problems that uh, we have been looking to, to uh, let's say isolate them and to understand these are the uh, problems that we have to solve. So let me, yeah. So is it the different patterns while sending these UDP packets? And is it from the infected device? Mm -hmm. This is what we are doing now. This is what we are doing that the UDP patterns are different. Uh -huh. But the the accuracy, when you use the model for, for, uh, for things, you get bad accuracy. But then you have to pinpoint the UDP aspects and say, oh, the distance is too much. So this is not the real uh, device. Okay. Yeah? So because the UDP, usually the denial of service attacks, they, when they are running, they have high communication with it, yeah. But this is only an assumption because there could be, in future, unknown attacks that would be much more intelligent than this one. So you have to be prepared for those as well. So here I just want to show you something about the second problem. The first problem was mentioned. What is when security gateway is compromised? What is when the data is poisoned? It's called adversarial machine learning. So if data is poisoned, if the model of machine learning is poisoned, so the weights are changed by adversary, or the data is poisoned, what do you do then? The second problem is, 
how accurate is this model of federated machine learning? What is the advantages of uh, federated machine learning compared to a centralized machine learning? If I have one server and give all the data to that server, and that server analyzes everything, analyzes everything, why do I need federated machine learning? So one aspect is that is the, the table there. First of all, the privacy aspect. Why privacy? Because in federated machine learning, we just send the weights. Oh, sorry. We just send the weights. We don't send any data. In a centralized server, you send all the data to the server. So the server has access to all the data. Here, you just send weights. From the weights, you cannot compute data. But you know the weights. So there is a problem of intellectual property. That means the company who makes the weights, the because if Did you have the assumption that when you are learning, mm -hmm. you are considering all the devices are benign, then why you can create a situation that the data might be applied? Very good question. Very good question. You get a washing machine. Yeah. One washing machine. Yes. So, this is what I didn't say because I thought nobody will ask this question. But you asked this question. So, yes. The first 30 minutes, the devices are benign because you're learning. Yes. After 30 minutes, any device can be compromised. Okay. Because this learning algorithm, this 30 minutes is only an uh, experimental result. Mm -hmm. Somebody may need 40 minutes. So you're yeah. you constantly updating your model as well? Yes. It's yes. not just after 30 minutes, you don't stop there. No, 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 no. So the 30 minutes, you assume that during this 30 minutes, when the gateway is collecting the data to uh, consider uh, fingerprints, and uh, um, anomaly, uh, let's say, profiling of devices, you must assume that because otherwise machine learning makes no problem. Don't forget that this is not a supervised machine learning. A supervised machine learning means that I have to have data before. I don't have, I want to have autonomous behavior, completely automatic. Hmm? Maybe, uh, what happens when, for example, a software that controls a device makes a failure? Very good question. I also didn't say that, and you were very, this is really amazing. I don't know what to do. You are asking very hard questions. No. no this, is a real, <laughs> this is a real important question. So two important questions. When you do update, and that's the, the whole problem here. When you do the update, you don't know if it's a benign or if it's a denial of service attack. What you do? And this is our solution. I don't know of any better solution. So each, each of you who has a better solution gets a very good pizza from it, a big, big pizza. Okay, so the solution is the following. When there is a, there is a synchronization between all these, uh, so the central server at Cisco says, now I want to update. All the gateways are, are, are informed, there will be an update. The algorithm have the, so, so, the, so, to, so to say, a kind of standby update. And then you do the update. So here, there is one administrator, at least, who are sitting in the center of the server of, of Cisco and knows what is happening. Because the update must inform the system. We don't have a better solution. Better solution would be that the system is sustainable. It does automatic uh, uh, update, but then the system must know when should I update. This is what you're working on. When should I update my system? The first thing that you can say is, is I identify an attack, then I update. When I want to update, I automatically inform all the gateways. Yeah, this would be what you're working on, but you have to show it in practice that it works. But this is a very good question. Yeah. So the the update of learning is continuous, and it is for every. Not time. only learning, devices. When a when, when a device in the network needs to be updated, and which is very often in, in IoT networks, um, <clears throat> then you need uh, somehow to inform your algorithm. This is uh, you must know that it's, it's update. This right. behavior is not a malicious behavior. It's a trusted system. So you need to understand this trust behavior as well, but. What we understood is that updates usually are new features. Yeah. And the distance between these new features is not very big. So you can also have a pattern for updates. 
but this is a more uh, academic solution for practical solution is enough that this thing works. So, yeah, yeah. so in, uh, but it's a very interesting test. So, and why is that uh, this simulated learning is more interesting? Because the bandwidth is different. We don't have, we don't need so many data to send, we just send weights. And the latency is different. Now, you still can say, oh, come on. Is that as accurate as a, a center of solution? You see here, we took five gateways, nine gateways, and 15 gateways. Here, we do a centralized server. All the data centers, the centralized server, centralized server generated. You see that the, the false uh, rate is zero, and uh, the positive rate is 95. Very, very good. When we take 15 clients, 15 uh, gateways, we have 94. If we have nine and five, we have still a good accuracy, as you have a centralized server. Now, why with 15 clients we have a bit less accuracy? Because the more you have gateways, the less, so the, the chunk of data gets smaller, the accuracy of each gateway is compared to the global model, smaller. Yeah, but it is still good because you have other advantages at the top. Mm. So do you also consider that each gateway might have different set of, sets of devices? Oh yes, these gateways might have overlap, mm -hmm. might have no overlap of devices. So for example, one gateway could be connected to IP camera, and another gateway to the same IP camera, but also a toaster. Okay. Yeah? They, they, they are independent. They send their weights without looking through other gateways. There is no synchronization between gateways. It's always going to send a server back. But what is important is that we don't want to give all the data to Amazon server. We, the gateway is a device that you buy from Amazon and, uh, from uh, Cisco and put it in your home. You have the control, at least this is what we, we think. Cisco has no control over that device, hopefully. Yeah. So this is what we compare the centralized learning with threaded learning, and now coming back to the attacks, data poisoning. There are a number of security aspects. If a device is linked to another device, if you do max spoofing, a device says, I am the other, the other device, how you can uh, argue that the system is still secure, we can ask later. But we go to the threat defended uh, poisoning, and then we close it and we can all go and sleep, okay? So, what is the adversarial machine learning here? This is a normal training process. You have data training and benign model. This is the case where we poison the data. So for example, near eye traffic is the adversary could stealthy, in a stealthy way, push data to gateways, yeah? So you are kind of poisoning it. Now, you can also poison, you can poison the model in this sense. You can also tamper with the machine learning algorithm, the neural network. You can change these weights, yeah? So poison the model. Now, these are the two, let's say, main attacks. So, now, the question is, if this gateway is malicious, and clearly, if more than 50% of gateways are malicious, we are done. We have no security. More than 50%, there is no, no way to, to control it, but assume that there is a certain number, n, let's say k from n gateways are compromised. And now the question is, how this global model should defend against it and how we can remove the poisonous data or the poisonous uh, model. So here, for example, eliminating the malicious local updates, or we use a kind of alternative aggression mechanisms like geometric means. So this aggression, what they do is that they say, okay, if some of these data that are coming from the weights that are coming from the gateways are poisoned, we average it out at the global model by using a more intelligent averaging system, like geometric mean. That would be one simple solution. 
but there are also other solutions like for example removing the data points usually uh, we, com we compute the distribution of data so iot devices th their communication is kind of identically distributed a right, toaster has very scarce communication uh, uh, pattern and it's kind of identically distributed if there are outliers that are not belonging to this distribution, we can take it out. Now, this, this is one approach that some people did against this uh, poisoning of data, which the paper is there at NIPS 2008. And uh, so this is the removing the outliers. Another thing is, what happens if the model, the weights of the neural network is poisoned? What you do, you do clustering. That means you do machine learning on machine learning models. So what you do, you say, I cluster these models, and then I do it always better and better so that malicious ones are separated from the real ones. This is another approach to do it. Yeah. And then, uh, let's say, for us, what we are doing, we are combining different methods and say, okay, if, if there are these malicious gateways and they have all these weights. That's all because we we send from uh, gateways only weights and not data. So what we do is we do a feature engineering that means we compute colorations between all these uh, weights, the distance between all these weights, and then use that to a kind of I mean, you don't need to know that it's called hierarchical density-based uh, clustering. We do clustering on these uh, weights, and then with the clustering, we can separate the cluster. Uh, the only thing that we do more is that we take more a more fine-grained way. What does this do? It does the following. It says, I assume that I have a benign behavior, and I assume that I may have different adversarial behavior. And then I can separate the adversarial behavior from the benign one. But I do not need to fix how many different adversarial behavior exist with this kind of machine learning. You can say the machine learning algorithm does it itself. At the end, there will be five different adversarial behavior, five different kinds of poisoning, and one benign. OK, so the clean model will be Okay, this is about the previous solutions that I already told you. What are the difference between the previous solutions? Uh, so, what we are working on currently is how to put it on a real world devices. This is done with Cisco on their own test bed. The second thing that we are doing is we are increasing the number of devices. So, if you have 1,000 devices and you have one year of, of uh, experimental results, then you have a huge database and you know what is what. And 1,000 devices are really, really good. That takes maybe one year. Not millions of devices, that would be, I don't know if we will have really millions of different devices. We will have equivalence classes, yeah. So, and then last thing that I would say is that for those people who are not interested in machine learning, to do automatic things, you need machine learning when you don't make any assumptions about the devices, any, any security assumptions, and for that, we need to consider the data and model quality. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Any questions? No, other people must also ask questions. Who ask questions always? Okay. So, uh, in, your, in your setup, like yeah. uh, you assume that always the devices will communicate through this uh, gateway. Yes. And in that case, how do you uh, do you consider like those IoT devices that comes uh, that come with their own hub, for example, the smart uh, Samsung smart chains. So in those cases, like those devices, yeah. whatever that goes through the hub, yes. Yes. And then you can only see IP packets from the hub. Exactly. And when the devices are behind the hub. Consider fingerprint of the hub. Okay, that's it. And that so the hub abstracts away those devices. Okay, but in that case, you cannot like 
particularly fingerprint each of the devices. Exactly not, because they are connected to the hub. Okay. If I if I can see this is the hub, I don't care what is connected to this hub or what is malicious. Okay. Okay. Even if a single device behind the hub is malicious, it doesn't matter. But they, the communication is encrypted typically. But we don't consider the we, just, we don't consider the, the, the payload. Uh -huh. We just look into the headers. Yes, yes. 